up until 1860, 1870, so the, you know, the first very formative years of Victoria in particular, and this is inclusive of you know, all of Australia, that transport was, was vital. The land down under, you know, the place, you know, the continent forgotten. And people had to get their goods you know, to the international markets. Very often the way to travel throughout um, places such as Victoria, which is, um, you know, has an extensive water, you know, sort of river system and creek system, was by canoes. What sparked my interest was looking through 19th century records and seeing how much involvement Aboriginal people had in ordinary, everybody Australian sort of lifestyles and how much they contributed was immense. And it really um, sparked a, almost a, an anger in, in me that, you know, why, why weren't we told um, this sort of uh, great stories. If you have a look at the history of settlement in this country, always in the background you'll, you'll see or know of Aboriginal people that supported those settlers. One of the best stories is about the gold rush, the 1850s, and how, if it wasn't for my family, my old people, the gold rush probably wouldn't have happened and the miners wouldn't have survived. Down here, in their quest to get to the um, Western Plains, had to use Aboriginal people to ferry their goods across the river. But not only that, it was places like the Werribee, they used old boards and fish traps to cross the Werribee. We know the general stories of the massacres, the violence, the, the, how they were done to. And we weren't told the stories, it's certainly in my schooling and certainly not in the books anymore, um, still, uh, the, the stories of how Aboriginal people contributed to you know, the nation that we are, that they were nation builders. And people at that time recognised it as such. The, the, the stringy bark canoe, which is common to uh, this part of, of Australia, it's specially selected. Uh, there, are, there are, you know, places where the, uh, as, as I understand it as a white historian, where, uh, you know, people were, as, had specific roles that, um, that they were excelled in making stringy bark canoes. Within any community, there's people, you know, you've got your your mechanics and you've got your, you know, your butchers and whatnot, and you know, there's no different within our community. Um, we had people with the skills and the knowledge to be able to, you know, to keep the community running. So whether that be, you know, hunting and gathering, um, making tools, um, making, you know, canoes. There's quite a bit of um, ingenuity in, in the making of, you know, literally making a stringy bark canoe from a living tree in a very quick period of time, which was usually, you know, sort of, it was required now. Um, you know, we've got instances where people use their bark canoes to, to go out on the swamps and get duck eggs and um, things like that. So even on the swamps and the rivers, um, people use their canoes to get food and stuff. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't really the bark they were after. If, if we, we know bark gets waterlogged and actually sinks, there's a, a little layer of wood just under the bark um, what protects the heartwood of the tree. And that's what they were after. It's called the cambium. It's a thin layer of wood under the bark. We know that they were very, very large. You know, we have accounts, historic accounts, of um, you know, up to 12, 14, 15 people you know, being ferried, you know, entire families and their dogs and all their goods uh, travelling along the, the major river systems of Australia. Aboriginal people and, and culture, tended, they tend to share stuff a lot, you know. If they went out hunting, they'd, they'd share the cats, the, the elders would get the good 
cuts of meat and etc. And they were more of a sharing society. So if someone come along and was stuck on one side of the river and said to the Koori fellow down there, can you help me get across the river? He wouldn't say bugger off, you know, he'd probably say, of course, yes, I'll, I'll help you. They were more of a sharing um, society. We, we tend to get a, um, it's, it's uh, I suppose what I'd call a myopic glimpse in that it, it, it's, it is largely through um, white historians sort of eyes of looking through white records. So it, it's, it's not a, a true sort of a view, if you like, of an Aboriginal perspective. But we, we certainly do get their voices come out through the, the pages of, of the white colonists. And those voices are usually ones of, uh, almost always, ones of uh, entrepreneurial skill. They literally would congregate around the, uh, the crossing points. Uh, the Aboriginal people had set prices to convey the goods and, you know, a set price for how many people they would take across. Usually my favourite stories are about uh, white people being rescued by Aboriginal people. I, I like that idea of, you know, the heroic, um, you know, it's so celebrated in Australia, that, you know, that volunteerism that is such a, a strong characteristic. For instance, a, um, an Aboriginal fellow uh, with his canoe uh, and the Gundagai floods that rescued uh, in one of the major floods that uh, Australia has ever experienced in the 19th century. I think they lost count at you know, 24 people, plucking them literally off the rooftops. You know, they, they faced you know, just uh, imminent death. He and his clan and his family had been colonised and their land stripped away from them and uh, you know, despised and ignored by white people. Yet when the moment called, he uh, got in his canoe of his own accord, not paid by anybody, and went and plucked people one by one at great peril to his own life in you know, swirling floodwaters. Um, and then you know, in a typically Australian way, just walked off the stage, didn't sort of wait for accolades, didn't, uh, he, job done. Oh look, it gives me a bit of um, you know, a, a high sense of admiration and, and um, you know, uh, and to think that the, the Indigenous people were out there helping the, the early settlers and helping the people who overrun their lands. Uh, yet we've um, placed this kind of like a veil over this window of, of um, Aboriginal entrepreneurship Aboriginal inventiveness. That's shown in this story. It's shown that we did care about people. We did have those values of respect, respecting people and valuing them, even though it wasn't returned. It, knowledge is power. You know, it's a bit of a cliche, but knowledge is power. And you know, every day you kind of learn a little bit more. So if someone's listening to this conversation, um, they can go, oh yeah, well maybe I should, you know, this is just one little kind of snapshot of, um, of one story, Aboriginal bark canoes, um, and hopefully it, for them, if someone's listening to this, it kind of, you know, gives them an appetite for, for more knowledge within this space. There is a, probably a whole book of these stories out there that, that some of we still haven't found and, and some we have and some we need to explore a bit more. Um, so it would probably go beyond my lifetime, you know. Um, there are probably kids that I talk to who will take this role on and still be researching when they're young adults. Um, so if I can help get that started, well, you know, I'll be a happy old man. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs>